this metric has been hiding in plain sight for decades. And to see so many businesses coalesce around this one single metric, it's just phenomenal. Welcome to Tip Top, Grow Up Your Business with Metronomics. Join me, Shannon Burns-Husco, and Metronomics Certified Coach, Jed Roberts. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, stories, on how you can grow your company up at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. On today's episode, we are talking to Greg Crabtree, author, entrepreneur, financial expert, and speaker. Greg's here today to talk about what he knows best and what we all need to know is about our economic engine in our business. Greg's written a few great books, one from 2010, one from 2020. It's all about simple numbers. Let's dig in and learn more. Well, welcome everyone. It's so great to be here with Greg Crabtree. I am a fan. I'm a super fan, have been for a really long time. Um, And one of the biggest reasons is Greg has brought together entrepreneurship and the pure passion around entrepreneurship and Greg's financial expertise. Amazing. Welcome, Greg. I appreciate it. Always glad to join you. So, If you don't know Greg Crabtree, Greg's uh, been, I don't even want to say how long, I think the last time I saw you, Greg, we had such a good conversation around growing businesses and around entrepreneurship and growth. But you know what, how I got introduced to Greg was, I don't, I was looking back, Greg, as I was prepping for this on how many years ago I uh, met you. I don't think it's been a decade, but it's been close to that. It's been Um, probably a little over a decade, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. it's been close to that. And one of the things that really uh, attracted me to Greg's thought leadership is all about the numbers, right? Keeping it simple, making it simple. Greg's written two books. Second book, Simple Numbers 2.0. First book, Simple Numbers. And you wrote them about a decade apart. Is Mm -hmm. that right? Yep. A decade apart. Can you just give maybe a little bit of your background around, you know, how you came to, you know, (laughs) think about entrepreneurship and numbers, but also why did you write the first book? And then why did you write the second book 10 years later? Yeah, basically I'm a recovering accountant. Um, You know, I, I, you know, I, I chose accounting because they work in an air conditioned office and they didn't gather eggs and hoe cotton every day. So growing up, on a chicken farm as a kid in Alabama, you know, it's like, Hey, that looked good to me. After about a year out of college, I realized, really, this is what I signed up for. Um, and fortunately I had some good mentors along the way that I could lean into some more interesting aspects of it. But, you know, really it, it, over the years, as I, you know, um, got back into public practice, I spent three years as a bank controller and VP of operations, and it's really, I, I probably learned more in those three years about accounting, applying it as the operations and financial lead of the bank, uh, and then got back into practice because I really missed, you know, variations of business. I, I, I get bored pretty quickly, you know, so I like a, I like a broad set of, of, of different things. And, um, but it was really the, the constant theme was my best clients were not very, financially savvy on a technical basis, but from a practical basis, they were so far above the accountants in true financial understanding, but they couldn't talk it. And so I I started picking their brains and what are you looking at? And I I always remember I had this client that was a, he was a marble contractor and just a, just a salty old savvy, you know, contractor. And he, he got so frustrated with the accountants that he built his own accounting program out of Lotus one, two, three macros. And he had this one page sheet that broke every rule of accounting known to mankind. It mixed balance sheet with P and L and cash flow with accrual and cash basis. And, you know, and all the accountants hated to work with him. And I, I just kind of grew to like the guy and, 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 you know, and, 
I come to see the genius of that one page, because in that one page, he could tell you the profitability of the job. He could tell you what his return on labor was. He knew who owed him money and who didn't, and he knew what his cash balance was. And it's like, hmm, you know, there may be something to this. And and the more just iterations of interactions, well, I mean, really, and then the big thing that pushed me over the top was when I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization in 2001, it changed my focus. I saw myself as an entrepreneur interacting with entrepreneurs versus yes. an accountant. Yes. As a matter of fact, when I would go to EO meetings, I would try every way possible to introduce myself to somebody without using the word accountant or CPA. Yes. Yeah. And I got to tell you today, Greg, it's why I didn't introduce you like that. I don't <laughs> yeah. think of you yeah. like that. Yeah. I know you're an entrepreneur and you really want to ensure entrepreneurs mm -hmm. find a simple way to understand the score. Yeah. Right. Well, and and really, so then that led to um, it, I, I did a stand neo leadership and those things, and that gave me some confidence of you know just testing my ideas globally with entrepreneurs around the yes. world, and and so when I got off the board, um, you know, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna I, I put my time back into the EO accelerator program to create yes. some content for that, and that was actually the basis of the first book, was the pro the presentation that I did for the early accelerator program, um, and and in that one, that was just a, you know, I I never thought I'd write a book in the first place, but but it was it was just changing the framework of how an entrepreneur should see financial information, right? right. And but what was funny was you know. Um, when I wrote the second book and released it in 2020, in 21, I went into the recording studio to do the audio book for both. And so you you get to hear the chicken farmer from Alabama read both of them, you know, because it's <laughs> it's got to be me that reads it. Yes, you know, and, and I so, agree. <laughs> but I remember I finished reading the first book because I hadn't read it in 10 years after yes. I wrote it. I mean, I would yes. talk about it all the time, but you never know what you wrote. In yes. a book. And yeah, I'm sure you're the same way with yes. what you wrote. <laughs> You know, but, but I'm reading it word for word, you know, and I get to, I get done with it and I pause for a moment when I've finished the last summary, uh, reading it and I go, man, that's a pretty good book. <laughs> so I was, I was very pleased with it. But what was bizarre was I had forgot all of the little Easter eggs that I had left questions to myself about in the first book that I answered in the second book without realizing it. I mean, and, and I mean, the, the two just dovetailed together so perfectly that, I mean, I, I couldn't have made it happen. It just organically happened, you know, in that process. And really, it is kind of this journey of helping entrepreneurs see first and foremost, I, I, I want to win this argument with every entrepreneur. Your business is the highest producing earning asset you will ever own if you pay attention to it. By far, I mean, it just blows away everything else. But, but secondly, there's only a handful of numbers that matter. The rest of it's noise, and 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 quit quit trying to calibrate a dough ball, and 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 think that you know just because I parse out office supplies, I'm going to figure out a magical way to become profitable. So. <laughs> yeah. So look, you write the first book. Ten years go by. Right. And I think the second book was 20, I want to say 2020, 2021. 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So like what made you, you know, pick it up and really go again? You called it 2.0. You reread the first one. I love that you did that. I am afraid to read one of my books. Oh, you, you have to do it. it has, it's still, I'm going to make the... myself do it in August. Yeah, I'm going to make it's... myself do it in August. Yeah, that, that was good. Well, the, 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 the thing that was the catalyst that was the missing piece was, so one of the things I get to do in EO world is I get to chair our executive ed program at Horton business school. And so first year I'm sitting in on the program. So in that one, you know, I always like to joke, you know, I get to hang out with like two legitimate professors and then I get to present some of my content. So, but, but what's been fun is I've learned a lot from them. Absolutely. But I've taught them a thing or two as well. And, and it's, we just have a really good relationship. David Wessels is the lead professor. I just thank the world of David. He's an incredible 
under knowledge resource in the, in the world of finance. Um, but in the first year, I'm sitting through the program first time like everybody else, and he's talking about return on invested capital. And I'm sitting in the back of the room going, man, you know, I, I've heard of that. I, I probably did it in college, but I don't measure that now. And I dug into that one. And that really became the missing piece because what I'm trying to do is build a containment field of financial understanding. I need to know what my profit level should be. Well, it, and it shouldn't be based on opinion. It should be based on what are the standards. There, there are standards for industries. And then I need to have capitalization. And, and this is the biggest challenge for most entrepreneurs. They, they understand a P&L kind of innately for the most part. But they don't understand the balance sheet hardly ever. No. And, and, and it's really, and, and we did it, the, us accountants, we did it. We screwed it up. We, we <laughs> teach the balance sheet horribly. And, and it hasn't evolved since the 1400s when Pacioli invented accounting. And so it's like, okay, I need to attack this in a different way. And, and I, I give credit to my, my colleague, Alan Miltz, with this. Alan, in some of his, uh, uh cash flow story discussion, Help me formalize some of my thinking. So it, it, it's a little slight derivation of how he approaches it. But, but like I said, he, he really helped me under, get, get my head around the idea. And I really break the balance sheet into three numbers. There's your, your cash number, which is what we call core capital target. There's your trade capital, which is working capital, excluding cash and debt. And then it's infrastructure capital. What's your equipment minus any debt associated with it? And that's the whole balance sheet. Of yeah. stuff that matters. Now, you might have yeah. crap on your balance sheet of something <laughs> yeah. that you do with your business that has nothing to do with operating your business. Yes. That doesn't go into return on invested capital. Yeah. Just the active assets and liabilities. Now, and, you talked, if I can jump in, because yeah. balance sheet, okay, that those are the things that matter. Yeah. And you talked about the handful. Like there's just a handful of numbers that we should all really be focused on that we should care about that, that most actually, I would say, and I'm going to say it like this entrepreneurs, there's just a lot of noise that we're getting in re our reporting, but we really like, what are those handful ones that you recommend that, that we all should be looking at? Yeah. So like when, when I got to, to speak at this year's metronomics conference, so really I would put it as four. These four are kind of the big four. Number one is I need to target a return on invested capital of a minimum 50% return. But if I'm really paying attention, that number shifts based on how heavy the capital is in my business. And we go in, in the world of entrepreneurism, this is what your P&L doesn't make you different. It's your capital that makes you different. And you've got light capital requirement businesses that are primarily execution driven. And you've got heavy capital businesses, which takes a significant bigger investment. But you got fewer people that can do it, too. I got less competition. So once I know the capital piece, I can get my return on invested capital, which then has to synchronize with our big one, labor efficiency ratio. And, and this is where, you know, I, I told the group, I said, I want you to remember one number, two. Can you remember two? I need 90% of the businesses in the developed economies work off of this standard. I don't care if you're in Canada, U.S., Australia, Europe, anywhere. I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor, regardless of whether it's direct labor, management labor, or somebody sweeps the floor, you know, or is, is the top exec. That's it. And, and this this metric has been hiding in plain sight for decades. And yeah. to see so many businesses coalesce around this one single metric I, is just phenomenal. Now, from there, we have some other finer tuned labor efficiency ratios, but those are more for the finesse of the strategy of labor as you deploy it. And are, am I getting better? Am I getting worse? This two LER is a health diagnostic. And I mean, I we and I can literally take a business and break them down immediately just from that one number. So, but then the next number that confirms it is what does it give me as a profit to gross margin? And this this is something that I, th this puts all businesses on the same level playing field. We we have got to get over this stupid stupid over focus of revenue. It's a starting point of math. It's the weakest number on the P&L. 
I just, just hands down. And, you know, and, and what really, what really galls me, and I'm, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. No, no, no. But no organizations like the Inc. 500, Inc. 5000 list is, is promulgators of this bad, 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 bad idea. Yeah. I, I mean, and it goes, that, that, that's all they measure. And, and yeah. one of the things I hope to do in the not too distant future, I've developed a scoring system of business health based around our simple it. numbers metrics. And love so, it. so be, be watching okay, for that. I can't wait for that. Because that'll yeah. be so useful because, uh, you know, a lot of the listeners are going return on invested capital, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that's important. Yep. Labor efficiency ratio, okay. Uh, you know, profit to gross margin, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. And, the and you know, and I'm going to let you do the fourth one. And then I want to, yeah. like, come back around and ask so you the, a couple so questions. So the fourth one is, are you fully capitalized? Yeah. And and this became a mission of watching good businesses fly too close to the sun, hit a bump in the road and die. Yes. And it's like, yeah. dang it. I mean, you know, but there was no standard of thought right. around right. what what how much cash right. should I have? You know, is is debt good or bad? Right. And so so kind of our philosophy is this. Listen, Term debt, I'm okay with as long as it's backing a productive asset right. that is properly valued relative to the debt. Yes. I'm okay with that. But line yeah. of credit debt, I mean, that's yeah. a slippery slope to hell. Very, very. It's got its needs of a moment, but it's t yes. it's intended to be temporary. And entrepreneurs, uh, bankers will, out of convenience, give you a line of credit when you probably don't deserve one. Because you've got other assets and those things, but but it messes up how everything connects. And so, I used to just you know just hound clients about oh you you don't have enough cash, but until I came up with this is another two. I need two months of operating expenses in cash, which includes all my labor and all my non trade debt that it doesn't count cost of goods that I get terms on everything, all my general operating expenses. If I have two months of that in cash, I'm, I'm good. If I have more than that, I have excess capital. If I have less than that, I don't have enough. And I think that's really important because, and you know, like we connect on many levels, but cash is one of those levels we connect on and being able to be comfortable, sleep at night, with the right amount of cash in the bank is critical. Being able to forecast your cash month over month, critical. Knowing where you're, what, what you're doing with it and making decisions on whether you are going to stay on your forecast for cash. So, th so this is an interesting thought that I've been testing out of late. So you've, you've obviously read uh, Eli uh, Goldratt's book, The yes. Goal. Yes. So we talk yes. about the theory of constraints. A few times. Yeah. yeah. And so everybody loves it. But yeah. Eli is talking about a constraint as a negative. Yeah. Well, guess what? There's good constraints. Yes. And labor efficiency ratio used as a salary cap techniques is a positive constraint. And I will tell you, and you, you, I guarantee you, you got tons of stories in your experience level as well. How many times you created success by introducing a positive constraint to the system? And say, prove it, prove me wrong, or else this is all I'm going to give you. Right, right. And I think that's what I love about, you know, those those four key numbers helps us to actually, and I know you're a fan of it, is forecasting forward, right? Forecasting what those should be as our plan goes forward. And having and keeping them simple is is the key, right? I I I, I love simple numbers, right? Uh, for many, many reasons. Um, but for anyone listening in who's probably going, that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook and sort of scares me more than helps me, depending on where their business is. Um, what are some key ways that they can learn about it, break it down? What are some things that you've experienced? You've worked with all sizes of entrepreneurs. So we're, we're close to the end of a month, uh, depending on whenever, whoever listens to this, just think of the next month. Yes. Okay. How much labor? I, I, I know with a week to go in this month, yes. I know how much labor is going to be next month within a Nats eyelash. Right. Okay. So I did this with an accelerator in Connecticut. I was teaching yeah. class last year. 
and she was struggling. And I said, she had a marketing agency. And I said, okay, here, you know, how much are you going to have in labor in the month of October? She said, $50,000 is great. 50,000 times two is what? $100,000. Do you have $100,000 of gross margin? So, it's, you know, you can't count the stuff you're going to bill and outsource to somebody right. else. So assuming you're going to do all that yourself, do you have $100,000 of work that you sold that your team can do in October? She says, yes, this is great. Can yeah. your team get it done? Yes, but what's the but? Well, we sold work in the prior months that we haven't finished yet that we've already been paid right. for. That's right. a problem. And yes. I said, now, here, here's your conundrum. Here's, here's, here's the constraint that you got to live through to get out of this hole. Yeah. You got to get your team together and says, listen, guys, here's what a good month looks like. I'm going to pay out $50,000 in wages and we're going to produce $100,000 worth of work because we're yeah. known in the industry and we've sold enough work and that's all good. But we're behind with this other stuff. And I need you for one month to be superhuman, which we all have an extra gear that we can go in there yeah. and make the sprint and finish the race and then get back on schedule. And I said, you just got to commit to do it. in a, it, If you let it go longer than a month, you'll never get there. You'll be, that's right. You'll be chasing your tail. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That's all it yeah. takes. And that's what makes it, you know, live, tactical. Yeah. Right. These are things we have to do, but we have the information to actually show us the way. Yeah. And there's so many times where month over month, that build, that miss, that carryover actually causes a business more grief than it should. Yeah, there, there's absolutely. no doubt. There's yeah, no doubt. Is, and and so the the thing that we love to do, so we do a lot of group presentations. Yes. Uh, and so these are really fun, especially if they're in the same industry. But we we actually get dissimilar companies together as well and do this. Yes. And they they get benefit out of it as well. Yeah. But the, the ones that are in the same industry, so we do a group of HVAC companies. And so it's about $100 million of revenue. And so three years ago, during the middle of COVID, I mean, they were okay, but that group was running, you know, probably about 10% profit to gross margin, which was below the target some of, of the group. And, and so once again, that they, they put equipment in place and they have labor that that's an HVAC service company. And guess what? You know what their total LER target is? It's a two. And, and it's like, this, I can do the same thing with those guys. And, you know, I take each company in the session when we go around the room and I just put them on the hot seat and I say, all right, here's where you're off to total LER. You got two choices. You can either cut to get profitable with what you got, or you can run as far and as fast as you can to sell into what you've committed to in labor. Right. We, we call growing into your footprint kind of first stage of denial. Um, <laughs> probably everybody generally needs to cut a little bit, you know, in that process. But, I, you know, hey, but we can quantify both answers. Have you ever come from the other side where you've done this work and the company is so like, so far below where they should be, right? They're, they're just scram like lots of growth companies are very conservative, right? And it needs a little bit of pushing to actually get them to invest, to unlock the growth. Well, now that's, that's a different discussion because once again, this is where the world of accounting is not your friend. We, we, we have these rules in accounting that screw things up and, and, and the data is muted and it can't, it can't tell its story. And so the idea is this is what we were and this and this was a big aha that we came up with in the 2.0 book and I call it launch capital. And so the idea is so you've been through this tons of times yourself and with with clients that go through a due diligence to sell the business. First thing you do in a sale of the business is called a, an adjusted EBITDA process. And all adjusted EBITDA is if a buyer bought this business sitting as it sits today, what expenses would it not spend? And sometimes that's people, sometimes it's stuff, but a lot of times it's people. And, and so, so the idea is we figured out a way that you separately account for any expense, including labor, that nobody is sticking a gun to your head and making you spend. The market's not making you do that. You're doing it by choice. 
that choice goes below EBITDA in the other expense section because it is a use of operating profit, not a creation of current operating profit. And then I can then track it to say, what have I spent? And then we have, so true to our 50% return on investment standard, in the future, I've got to be able to pay for that expense plus get 50% more on top of it. That's what success looks like. Now, feel free to blow it through the roof above that, but the minimum return. So I don't care if it's marketing. I don't care if it's tech dev spend. I don't care if it's extra humans on the payroll. That's your, that's your goal of doing it. And we use two case studies. One is a restaurant. One is a, um, a, a, we don't tell what the name of the other business is, but they were both live businesses that we worked with. And there's two case studies in, in uh, chapter six of the, the 2.0 book that walk you through this alternative way of seeing here's how you track the cost. Here's what you now hold it accountable to. And if it does not work, you stop spending it and do something different. Yeah. And, and I like, so. I mean, it's so important that the case studies were so helpful to understand this because you can put yourself into that situation and, you know, work your way through it. Now, we work with and you have worked with a lot of growth companies, right? And, and you know, when we think about those four key, you know, measures of success, when we think of a growth company, you know, like a lot of growth companies are just trying to hang on right? They're trying to hang on in so many ways. What's your best advice for thinking about where you've come from, your financial expertise, your entrepreneurial expertise in, in giving, you know, anyone listening and most listeners are in, everybody wants to grow. What are the key things, you know, on how to put this in place? Like what's step one for a company is in high growth mode. What should they do first? What should they do second? Well, I think step one, step one is I've got to do that adjusted EBITDA calculation. What is, what does my business look like when I'm not trying to grow it? Right. Is it viable? Because yes. I've seen a lot of growth companies that, listen, your baby's ugly. <laughs> I got news yeah, for nobody you. wants I mean, to hear that. We we gotta <laughs> we, we gotta fix this piece first because why would yep. you grow it? Getting yep. bigger doesn't make it more profitable. Yes. Um so let's fix that first. Then, okay, what are the catalysts to growth? Is it marketing? Is it tech dev? Is it a, a new COO? Is it yeah. biz dev? You know, whatever. I you know, all of those things are ingredients. But this is really where I love Annie Duke's book, Quit. Because I think every entrepreneur needs to read that book because it's, it's, she, tons and tons of behavioral economic stories because really business is just a, it's, it's a petri dish of human behavior mixed with finance that, I mean, because I can give everybody the same playbook, but I get a different outcome with every human. Yes. So guess what the variable is? The human. Yes. And I couldn't so, agree with you more. Yeah. And, Always. But her 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 stories about sunk cost theory, when, when yep. do you quit yes. to then restart something different? And, right. and I think quitting is the hardest thing for an entrepreneur uh, to do. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think about, you know, in my first business where, you know, we started on one path. We had to stop that path and go to another path. And then we stopped that path and ended up, you know, as an internet payment service provider for the time. We are just, uh, and, and it's it's hard to get the whole team behind, you know, stopping this and starting that or selling this for that, right? Um, and behavior, we know, I love the way you said that because behavior is the number one thing when we, when, when we think of the sport of business. We can have the same playbook, we can have the same methodology, but we'll get different results based on who's involved in driving it, how cohesive the team is, all those things. One of the things that, um, you know, I, I was absolutely attracted uh, in your framework, 
you know, is something that we actually went over the top with, which was that 36 month rolling forecast, like 36 months of forecasting cash. Um, we did it out of pure desperation of making sure everybody could see the path. Now, I know you, you don't go as long as 36 months, like in metronomics, but I know that, you know, I've heard from different 12 to 18, and I think 18 is sort of the max you'll go, but talk to that a little bit. Yeah, but, but it, I, I, I'm still give a pretty good ode to that 36 month view because when our primary, the first sheet that I show a client in doing analysis is our rolling 12 this month over the last three years. And so I'm not summing those, but I'm definitely showing 36 months of path. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're now, and, and so, so really the idea is every business needs to look at, you know, if I'm a, if I'm very little sensitive to seasonality, then, you know, those businesses can look at rolling 12s, rolling threes. A month is always a very small unit of time. So just be careful with months, you know, but, but for the most part, rolling 12s, rolling threes. Um, but that three year view of things is very, very, very powerful. And, and we got people all over the board right now. I mean, I got people that are doing this and I got people that are doing this and I, you know, and, and doing this. And I mean, they're, 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 they're going crazy right now. But once you, but when you see or, you know, looking at gross margin percentage, labor efficiency ratios, direct management and, and total LER and profit to, to gross margin. And, and the one that's really popped out of late that's I've added to it that we have to pay attention to is operating expenses. And you might call it overhead, same difference, operating expenses to gross margin. That, that has been the purest indicator of true inflation because used to, you could get lift of activity with no change in OPEX. And now, I mean, OPEX is just a monster that's beating the crap out of everybody everywhere you turn. And it's a it's a snake with a thousand heads. There's not just one cost that you can go change. And I think the thing that I that you know we caught on to just purely because we needed to show this trajectory of this rolling, right? The rolling. And we were a young business, so we didn't necessarily have the history that a lot of our businesses have today. And it's pretty amazing that we can show that history of what's happened in the business to where we are now and then have that rolling forward. Um, seeing it is, and, and uh, seeing it just, you know, changes a view for sure. And we're trying to create confidence in the growth, you know, that plan and that strategy and having that, you know, I'm all about helping an entrepreneur uh, and the leadership team that CEO see the way forward. Because if they don't see the way forward, they're just driving around the block. When you can graph rolling 12 revenue, rolling 12 gross margin, rolling 12 total labor, and then rolling 12 profit, you start to understand the dynamics of, listen, this the business is pretty straightforward. And it, it it's going to make you deal with some stuff that you don't want to, but but it is that relation that relationship of total all labor to gross margin you that revenue number can flop around all you want but it is you know what was the margin that we got out of that and that's that's what matters and i think one of the things that we grew out of learning about mini games from the great game of business, right? And we took those mini games from being financial to being widgets, what we call the the non-fiscal things that flow through your business, you know, and building up that rolling forecast, you know, rolling forecast of all the fiscal assumptions we've made. We have the history and then we're making assumptions going forward. You know, we layered in the history of the widgets to the forecast of the widgets. And, you know, can you speak to that a little bit about, because, you know, the fiscal is the outcome of those things that flow through your business. 
Yeah, I I wish all of my clients had a widget they could count, even if it's a service. But the challenge, I, I think the, our, our clients who struggle the most are the ones that there's not a measurable thing that got produced or done or or made. And the ones that can. I mean, the, I mean, you really, I mean, I, I mean, to get it in the most narrow sense. So I've got this large, uh, chemical manufacturer and, um, you know, they're about 50 million in revenue. And, you know, I spent a full day with them going through all their numbers and they got a fancy, you know, finance team and a CFO and, and a controller and all those things. And, 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 and they know their, their operational numbers well. But I said, listen, guys, I'm going to finish the day with tell you just all you need to know is one thing. You need your sales team needs to sell two dollars of gross margin every week for that week's payroll, and you're fine. I that's it. I mean, you know, and and it is. I mean, it it is just shocking. I mean, it's a really complex business of they they're really good at you know operational throughput and managing the lines, but yet. Even in their case, we found as as we dug down and do next level analysis of where you can take somebody to the next level is we've identified a significant amount of revenue that they literally make zero margin on. Yes, yes, and, and you even know, even a, uh, even a yeah. sophisticated business, I know. you're going. I know this is this is free How money is hiding yeah. in plain sight. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the work that you've done, the work we've done in peeling back into the business, you know, one of the tools we use is the key function flow map that we don't allow, although it's follow the dollar, we don't allow dollars in there. We're following the things that people have to do every day and that they control in the business. And it's really interesting because we peel out so many things that they're doing, but that's not driving to, you know, putting dollars in the bank. Well, I mean, you, you hit upon one of my favorite things to pick on is we, we, we focus on busy rather than being effective. And I don't care how busy you are. What did you get done? And are you working on the right things? It drives the, you know, drives where we're going, drives those numbers. Because those numbers reflect, you know, at the end of the day, it reflects the cash that's going into the bank. And so, so getting back to what you said earlier about companies who need to grow. I mean, so if I tell them first and foremost, figure out of the thing that you're doing, is it profitable before we try to grow it? And then what are my catalyst? But the other thing that I think we've had to introduce, you know, in the last uh, four years is market assessment to a much greater degree than we've ever done. And we live in a different world now. I mean, the next 20 years is not going to be like the last 20 by a long shot. And it doesn't mean you can't grow, but growth is going to be a street fight. It's not going to be a participation trophy ceremony because we were all just growing with a massively growing marketplace. And now you've got to go get market share. And that is a different fight than riding the wave of a growing market. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, there's so many, uh, you know, I can't even think uh, right now of any of my clients who are not in a a market, you know, that they're not fighting in, right? And the whole goal, we're trying to help them find that unique and valuable position to move them in the market to ensure that what they're investing in is going to make the return. But the biggest thing is, and why the work you do is so important is to give the visibility of that investment back into our numbers. And those four critical numbers are, are the thing. And when I think about, you know, the the, you know, probably the, all the different growth companies we're working with, visibility creates confidence, which, you know, gives like, ah, oh, make better, faster decisions. Because when we're going, you know, our financials are there and what we're doing is there to make better, faster decisions at the end of the day. And this is really where, especially the bigger you get, you start to evolve into, you, you actually have multiple segments to your business. You're not doing just one thing. And and that next ele elevation of understanding is what is the contribution from each group and not do it in the class. This is my other complaint about accounting. But I, I learned this in my first job as controller for the bank. I did the first ever branch P&L for the bank. Like a good accountant, I allocated every cost out, everything balanced, which means we're a success as an accountant when everything balances. 
wrong. I sent it out to the branch managers and they go, what? I don't have anything to do with that. And that, you know, you know, and I'm listening to them and I go, you know, they're right. So I redid it. And this time I only allocated to the branch anything that was a turn on cost to that branch and would turn off if they went away. And I had branches that were deposit generators that the other branches were loan generators and the loan generators had to pay a cost of money to the branch that generated the deposit and the branch that loaned it got the rest of the differential off of that. And all of a sudden everybody said, great, this makes sense to me. And I needed, I needed deposit generating branches. I needed loan generating branches. And and that always stuck with me that I don't have to allocate costs because those costs that generally us accountants allocate, I mean, I, I refer to it as a jobs program for accountants. I mean, that, that's all allocation does. It just keeps an accountant busy, you know, but I just, I need to keep those costs in its pool because it's it's just a core cost of it's, it's a cost center that if you change one of those other things, that cost center doesn't move. So I better find a way to cover it. Yes. So three more questions. Well, maybe more, but three more questions. One is thinking about, um, you know, anyone who's listening in and, you know, some will be familiar with your work. Others will not be. What are, what's the three next steps they should take if they've never heard of simple numbers? They don't know what these four great, (laughs) right, numbers are. What, what, what do you recommend? What are the next three steps they should take? Well, I mean, I think a lot of times, I mean, there's people that come to us just because somebody like you said something and then they just want immediately want to have a discussion. So if you want to cut through edu- self-education, knock yourself out, we're glad to talk to you and we'll, we'll, we'll give you the, the private version. But I mean, I freely allowed my presentations to be videoed. So if I'm about the easiest person in the world to find. So if you search on Greg Crabtree or simple numbers, you're going to see a ton of podcasts, a ton of, of presentations. Um, you know, um, both books are, are easily available. They're on audio as well as Kindle. Uh, so, so those are tip, typically the way I do define the books. The, the first book is really focused on the five million and under business. Um, I, I, I wrote both of them where they can stand alone. You can read the second book without reading the first one. If you're a five million and higher business, I would say just read the second book because it is more geared to a more sophisticated, you know, you know, size. But we believe the principles that I wrote about in 2.0. And they they apply to billion dollar businesses. Uh, it it knows no top. So yes, that's excellent. Second second question is um, for a growth business. So and um, I think I know your answer. It, and if they're like trying to figure out, uh, is there one number more important than any other numbers that you talked about? Which one do you go to? Which is the one that you'd say put this one in first? Figure this one out right away. It's actually a, a slight derivation of the two. So I'm looking at capitalization as well as profitability. And so in the, the 2.0 book, we talk about this, we, we call it CPR, the cash power ratio. And so what we love is convincing growth minded companies to understand how to grow cash flow free. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things. I was hoping you'd talk Gosh, about. Gosh, there is, is just my favorite thing. So many people who don't real you don't listen. You don't need any cash to cash in your problem. You just need to go execute. You're just not figuring out the right things to do. No, but no. every dime of new revenue that you go get, it you're make you're creating cash. Yeah. So and that and the key there is. When I balance my accounts receivable work in progress inventory net of accounts or accounts payable and deferred revenue, if I get those things to play nicely together to where I'm living off of either my customer and or my vendor's money, it's an execution game. And yeah. I, 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 a entrepreneur who gets it down to an execution game can win more often than anybody else who doesn't realize that. Yeah. And they have the opportunity to, you know, go to the next step if they want to, but they yeah. have an opportunity to win. If they, and, they don't get their execution game down, they don't have a chance to win. And what's really bizarre about this, because, you know, 
for years, accountants have talked about days, sales and out in, in receivables, days of inventory, days in AP and all, and all that. But the problem is you're fighting a one legged battle because you're going after a component rather than seeing it in total until we came up with a trade capital concept that stripped out cash and stripped out debt from working capital. And you compare that number to your rolling 12 revenue uh, uh, and as a percentage versus profit. That's a quick cash calculation to tell you, do I burn cash or, or create cash when I grow? And and once I do that simple calculation and, and like just the call I got off of before this, I'm talking to one of my larger clients about, listen, guys, I mean, your trade capital is inched up 3% from what it normally is. And in their case, that's $3 million of their money that used to be in cash. And I said, who, who's, who's asleep at the switch? Cause this, sh- there's no market movement that's telling us it shouldn't be $3 million less in that process. And, and, and once they see it, it's like, this is the rewarding thing. We get to see people start to take action. And, and that's all I'm trying to come up with. What is the, I'm, I'm, I'm a behavioral economist by, by actuality. What is the piece of data I can show you to get you to act differently? And that I think is the most amazing thing. Why I was attracted to your work early on, still attracted to the work you do is because the, you know, there's a critical path to grow. And if we don't have our cast system in order and we don't have visibility in our cast system, it's really hard to grow. All we do is worry about cash, right? And then we can't even get time to execute, but the cash and execution system go together. When we can get that lined up with the right leadership team and it's cohesive and doing all those good things, we actually then have time to map our strategy, right? But we have to get a cash system going. But, you know, and you probably had this too, where people would come to you and they're talking about raising money and I go, why? <laughs> yeah, you, don't, yeah, you don't need money. I do. I ask that question all the time. <laughs> like, you, know, you want to give equity? I mean, I'll, if you want to give me yeah, some equity, yeah. that's great. But, but I, I would tell you, you're crazy. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely there to help them preserve their equity. That, that is for sure. That's right. Sometimes it, it, people, you know, I hate to say it like this, but it's, it's, you know, we'll open up and sometimes pretty cool to raise some money. It's, it's actually cooler to figure out how to do it through where you are in your business and looking at your ratios within your business and looking at your cash, having the rules around how do you forecast cash. And, I- and this is really where, yeah, so when you can forecast P&L and balance sheet and cash flow, I mean, I, I, I just go to the model and said, you know, here's what you told me the P&L says, here's what, you, here's what the balance sheet's going to move relative to that. I don't see you running out of cash anywhere. So why are you raising money? And then there's other situations where we know I've been in those situations myself where we rent and raise money, you know, on day two of the business, right? We told the story, raised cash. We- I will say this. Th- th- there was a really great question asked at the roundtable that, that I was at uh, at your conference. And one of the guys was a startup business. And so he had, had no revenue. And so he was and he said, how do I apply simple numbers if I'm r- raising money? I said, it, it actually is quite simple. I said. You, when you go raise money, you're going to take that money and split it into two pieces. The first piece you're going to split into is you're going to treat it like a contract for services. You're going to look at what did I promise to do? What is the time frame that I'm going to deliver it in? And I'm going to hand that money back to me across the use of that as a contract. And I've got to hit a profit number. The other piece is the buffer of whether I'm successful or not at hitting that milestone, the rest is the buffer to get to the next stage of transition. And I, I got to look at those two pieces that way. S- such good advice because a lot of people raise money, get a lot of money like we did. You know, we we got into this whole forecast cash first in our cash system because we had a lot of cash and we wanted cash hitting the bottom line. Right. We want to be, we had cash. We were not making money. We were not putting cash back into the bank. So it was really important to us to be able to see that. And a lot of people go, Oh, you had so much money. Why did you forecast cash first? It's like the business had to be making money. Right. Which it wasn't about raising money. It was about making money. Well, and, and these experiences, I mean, I, all of our experiences shape our thinking. And I had these, this one SaaS client that 
you know, they, they fortunately got paid a year in advance and in sometimes as many cases, three years in advance. And so on, on a cash basis, they were profitable on an accrual basis. They were digging a hole to China, you know, and, and so that's fine. So we go along. And, and so, so fortunately, you know, I was able to show both versions. And so we, we monitored it. And so as they were moving along and growing that they, they believe that, okay, well, we're a tech company. We're supposed to spend all our money. And I go, mm, no, we're not. But they were one of the ones that formed my thinking around this, this, uh, this launch capital idea. So at the end of each year, I would ask them, okay, what did you spend that nobody made you spend? And then what did it produce? And it was roughly a million to a million three a year for the last three years of the business before they sold that it's like, and they admitted it produced zero benefit. And I go, guys, what are you doing? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because my sec- like our first business, we raised a lot of money. Second business, we customer funded it. We didn't put any money in. And we did one, two, and three year as SaaS business, you know, agreements. We were crazy about making sure that, you know, cash was going to things that were producing, not just producing zero, you know, for our business. I mean, and we had, you know, it was the fourth business in on metronomics. So we had the discipline around the cash system to really save us. That is it. That is, you know, there's just, you know, my profession is horrible at telling people these systems of containment because they're, they're caught up in general accepted accounting principles or international financial reporting standards. And it's like, no, 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 that, those are, that's not, you don't use those to run a business. You know, things like, you know, you know, your, your system is, that's a system that you run a business off of. The accountants, they'll come up with all their stuff. That, that is, that just doesn't matter. You know, but it's, it's that understanding that, that you've got to have that process in place. Yeah. You have to. Okay. Second to last question. Um, what's your best piece of advice you could give to a high growth? CEO, entrepreneur, leader who's listening in. What's your best piece of advice for them right now? Well, I, I mean, I think there it goes back to be extremely clear on your core business and the catalyst that you're spending for growth and the return on investment on those catalysts. Because I don't think growth in the next 20 years is going to be linear. You are going to enter a phase of what I refer to as base camp growth. You're going to have moments of opportunity to turn on growth and the market will stall and you'll plateau. And I've got to then take those catalysts and turn them off or conserve as best I can. Pause, read the market. Okay, when's the next yeah. opportunity? Okay, go. And then go again. That's right. Perfect. And, yeah. Love that. Love that. Where can people find more information about you, what you do, how you support entrepreneurs? Where can people go to find more info? Yeah, so the so we're now part of a national uh, firm in the U.S. called Car Rigs and Ingram, but our unit's called SimpleNumbersCRI.com. So you just go to that website. Um, I uh, for speaking and book. Uh, if you if, if some people uh, will do books for their team or buy them in bulk, I now actually have a speaker website, and you'll notice if when you go to GregCrabtree.net, you'll notice the pictures look familiar to you. <laughs> I I know where those pictures came from. I it was like very it. it was very yeah, I just uh I just had a one of my clients help me create just a speaker website Love which I'd it. never done before. And and thanks to uh, some some high quality <laughs> photos from the Tip Top uh conference uh it, it worked out time yeah, perfect we had timing. Some great photos. And uh, thank you for, you know, joining us at Tip Top. Thank you for joining us here. Yeah. Um, what a, what an honor. And, um, yes, Greg's available for speaking, uh, coaching, you know, you're, if you're all about growth, dig into your numbers. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for being here. Really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this proven 20 year old system will save you time and money as you grow up your business. Visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments and suggest topics you'd love us to explore the next time. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else that great podcasts are found.